else, let's prepare for worship. We're lucky this morning to have another person play for us. <laughs> please stand. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, and now the promised hour has come. Let us worship God. Our hymn is Lift High the Cross. Let us unite our hearts in the prayer for this Lord's Day. Holy God, by the cross and resurrection of Jesus, you lift the suffering world toward hope and transformation and open the way to eternal salvation. As we move ever closer to the passion of Christ, may your law of love be written on our hearts as he draws all people to himself, revealing your love for the world. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us confess our sin unto Almighty God, trusting in God's promised mercy. The whole congregation complained in the wilderness, saying, Draw near to the Lord who has heard your complaining. Look deeper into the wilderness. God is there, not here. God will provide enough for each, and the price is that no one will have too much. Let us take a time of silent prayer. The Gospel was declared that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven, and so, as God's own people, let us be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind. May we always be as ready to forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven us. And above everything else, may we be loving and never forget to be thankful for what God has done for us. Amen. Please stand. Before the piece, I have to tell you, it was fun to watch you hit that in the land of Monroe County. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with you. Please greet one another. No, you don't want to because I'm sick. Well, thank you, congregation. Please be seated. Children, please come join Mr. and Mrs. Lavador. Oh, oh, yes, absolutely. Hit the button. We're going to do something a little different today. If you want to stand around, we're going to come this way. Mr. Labrador has a special treat. Lucas, come over here. <laughs> um, what happened? I'm going to ask. I'm not kidding. I'm going to ask you. 
What happened on Friday? Well, what made Friday a special day? And please don't say the snow. Because that was very special for me. So, you know, what happened? Not, not that, not yet. This past Friday. You're, the Good Friday's coming up in a couple weeks. This past Friday. I think it was the 20th of March. That's okay. First day of spring. Absolutely. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Lavender. We have to be able to talk really loud so everyone... Okay. Well, first day of spring. Let me give you guys a little bit, a couple of visuals here. Um, what might you think of on the first day of spring? Easter. Easter. Yes, okay. right. But what specifically might you think about? You might think about it in the day. See, what happens on the first day of spring? That actually happens twice a year, but on the first day of spring, we have what is known as an equinox. And equinox means And there's a pull, there's a, there's a pull being exerted on all objects. And one of the things that I used to do for the first day of spring, I'm a little bit retired middle school teacher trying to keep the kids busy. So I would take an egg and I would put an egg out. Easter, absolutely, new life in Easter, and before and before we leave, we're going to have a prayer. But I'd like to. I I almost forgot. How can we do that? We didn't pass the pez. So, there you go. I know. I borrowed it. I borrowed it from Pastor because I left Miss Piggy at home. So, so thank you, um, children. Think about think about new life. Think about what the egg represents. And uh, next week when we have our Palm Sunday Easter egg hunt kind of all ties together. One more thing, um, kids, before we leave, everyone, did everyone get the, the box? There's another one, and here's one. And if you didn't, there's more out uh, right outside the Arthex, and you pick one up on the way out and bring them back next week. And can we have a, a prayer before we leave, please? Thank you, Lord, for our children and for and for the time of spring um, and, and, and the warmth coming around the corner. Thank you all for Easter and the promise of Easter and new life. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the hymn.
happy spring. <laughs> Jeremiah, the Old Testament I'm reading today is Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, and can be found on page 735 in your pew Bible. A new covenant. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant they made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The epistle lesson is from Hebrews 5, chapters, chapter 5, verses 5 to 10, and can be found on page 220 in the Pew Bible. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of this flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from the death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Thank you. Hear also the gospel for this Lord's Day from John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just as a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the roar of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Here ends the scripture for this Lord's Day. May it be a blessing to our hearts.
Grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I recently completed reading Peter Brown's compelling biography of the story of the life of uh, St. Augustine. It runs about 550 pages long and is quite intricate in its detail, and it's uh, highly accomplished in its scholarship. One of the interesting things that I learned about St. Augustine from reading this biography is something that I hadn't previously known about his preaching style. Now remember that Augustine was a bishop in Africa, a bishop of Hippo, which if we were to translate Hippo into minor league baseball terms, it would be a partial season A league town not a triple-A town, and certainly not the big leagues. He was Bishop of Hippo, and yet from this small outpost in Africa, he went on to significantly impact the development of Christian theology, not only for Africa, but throughout the world. And a lot of it had to do with his preaching style. As St. Augustine would preach, he would periodically pepper his sermon. He would pepper his sermon by stopping and staring at the congregation and saying, why? Augustine dared to ask, why? Why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus choose to engage these people this way? Why, 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 why? In a world which did not ask the question why, Augustine asked why and encouraged his congregation as it encountered the scripture to ask why. This morning's gospel gives us a splendid occasion to exercise the homiletic style, the preaching style of St. Augustine, and to pause and ask ourselves, why? In this morning's passage, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Why? I mean, when you think about it, for 30-some years, the hour had not yet come. When you think about the journey that Jesus had with his disciples, when he did reveal the intricacies of himself to them, he often cautioned them to, to kind of forget about it until later. Just, just, just put a lid on it. It's not time yet. When you think about it, you can remember the many times where Jesus would say when people were pushing or prodding him, my hour has not yet come. And yet today, in this passage, in the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Why? Well, as you start to take this story apart, this this pivotal story, this hinge, you start to, to get a sense of an acceleration of events that brought Jesus to this time and this place, this hour, This moment when he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The first clue occurs in verse 27 when he says, now my soul is troubled. He uses a very specific Greek verb here. You don't see this verb for being troubled very often. Now is my soul troubled. Of course it was troubled. He's anticipating the cross. Who in the right mind wouldn't be troubled? But the same verb occurs in just a couple stories before this story. Just a couple stories back, this sense of profound, quickening, troubled, upset and turmoil appears. Do you know where? The story of Lazarus. When Jesus stands there where they buried his friend, He is shaken to his core, his foundation. His soul is troubled. He cries. But in the second time he encounters the grave, 
then he is disturbed. That's what this means. Jesus has experienced the death of his dear friend. Jesus waited for that death that the glory of God could be made manifest. And yet he's overpowered by that sense of loss, that brokenheartedness that comes when someone you love dies. Being a pastor is a privilege because in part you get to journey with people through the valley of the shadow that Tim mentioned earlier. You get to stand by their side with them as they mourn the loss of a spouse or a brother or sister or a very dear friend or even worse sometimes a child. Jesus had his soul troubled not only as he anticipated the cross, but earlier when he stood at the grave of a friend and he lost a dear friend. In response to that event, he cries out, Lazarus, come forth, and miracle of miracles, Lazarus comes back to life. The next event that follows this unbelievable event is the response of Mary, Lazarus' sister. Mary loved Jesus. In appreciation for Jesus, in love for Jesus, she takes a, a pound of pure nard, pure nard ointment and uh, perfume, and, and she anoints Jesus' feet. You remember that story? It wasn't expected. It wasn't demanded. It, it wasn't solicited. But her response of pure love for Jesus moved her to take care of Jesus in a special, sensitive way. It was at that time that Judas threw a fit. How come you're letting her do this? That money could be used for taking care of the poor, and I'll keep an eye on that money for you, Judas said, dipping in liberally, I'm sure. And Jesus said, be quiet, for she is doing a beautiful thing for me. In that event, Jesus recognized not only the love and devotion of one of the disciples, he recognized that she was preparing him in a special, symbolic, perhaps unconscious, pre-conscious, subtle way for, for his funeral, for his burial. Next in this chain of events, we see Jesus entering the holy city of Jerusalem. Now I know, Palm Sunday's next week, but this story actually follows Palm Sunday. Well, what are you going to do? Jesus enters Jerusalem and he received the acclaim of the people as the long-expected Messiah. They had longed for a Messiah and Jesus comes into the holy city of Jerusalem for Passover. The palms are laid out and the acclamations occur. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But did they see Jesus for who he really was? They understood his messiahship, but did they understand the content and the context of that messiahship? No, they were hopeful for their kind of a messiah. One of political clout, one that would deal with the Romans, one that would expedite their wish list. And then we have this passage here before us today. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and said to him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Wow. I went to college at Westminster College in New Wilmington, Pennsylvania. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. New Wilmington has one, one traffic light. It's not even a traffic light, really. It's just a blinking light to say, be cautious. As a college student, we used to say they had the light to say, be cautious, because if you blink, you're going to miss New Wilmington. 
so too we could easily miss the subtlety that is in fact the profundity of this text. Jesus has felt a quickening of his soul at the death of his friend and wants to deal with death a final blow. These, Jesus is prepared for his crucifixion and his death by Mary who anoints him. Jesus is acclaimed by the crowd who call him Messiah but understand his, misunderstand his Messiahship. And then some Greeks come by and they say, Sir, we would see Jesus. Being smart Greeks, not Jewish Greek Christians, but probably proselytes, they look for an inn and so they go to, to Philip, who has a Greek name from a Greek town, and then to Andrew, who has a Greek name from a Greek town, and they make their entree to see Jesus. With these Greeks coming to him, he now declares, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He does so because he's going to show them Jesus. He's going to show these Greeks, these non-Jewish persons, who he is in his quintessence. He is not just the Jesus Messiah of Bethlehem. He is not just the Jesus Messiah of Nazareth. He is not just the Jesus Messiah of Galilee. He is not just the Jesus Messiah of Jerusalem. He is not just the Jesus Messiah of Israel. He is the cosmic Christ who comes to redeem and save the entire world. He is the one who will show himself to the Greeks and to the whole world. When he says, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. He is the Messiah, the Christ, who is willing to die to have the core of his being ripped open as a seed is ripped open, so that from that event, from that very event, much fruit will come. Fruit for the whole world. The hour has come to comfort those who stand by the grave. The hour has come for those who seek the Holy One to love and adore Jesus. The hour has come for those who need a Messiah and a Savior so desperately. The hour has come to redeem a wanting world. The hour has come for us to follow Jesus and to lose our lives in that following and to find our lives in that following in a life of love, care, justice, and mercy. Now my soul is troubled, Jesus said. Indeed it is, for he is about to take upon himself the sin of the whole world. He is about to conquer the ultimate enemy. Yes, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand for the hymn.
Wasn't that a beautiful hymn? A little uh, Gaelic melody there. Let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and let us receive the offering. to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow You. We thank You that You are the Christ of the whole world. You are our Christ. And we would, if we could, anoint Your feet like Mary with our love and our devotion, with the depth of our souls. Receive our prayers for others, for Carol and Jean, for Walt and Wendy and John, for Linda and Booter and Betty, for Tom and Marie, for Anita and Todd and Darlene, for Sherry, for the Rinker family and Tim, for David, who we rejoice returned home this week, for Rebecca, comfort the Weber family in the time of the death of Robert, be with Ken as he approaches surgery. Holy One, we commend to oursel ourselves to your care and ask that you would give all who need it your healing touch, encouragement, vision, confidence, and good faith in Jesus. And so now we take to our lips the prayer the Master taught us, saying, 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Number 69, I, the Lord of sea and sky. Before the benediction, I see Emma Menio is here, back from Dartmouth. A virtual hug to you, congregation. I expect you to all give her a hug on my behalf, okay? And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon and abide with you all. Each and every one now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.